Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Acts chapter 27, starting with verse 39, and then going through 28 verse 10. So if you've got a Bible, make sure you grab it and it's open. Your nose is in it, up, down, up, down. You know, that's what we, we want. We want to dig into the Word together. As we look at a passage like this, I think, or this is at least for me personally, maybe you're like me, it's really easy to miss the forest for the trees. When that passage was just read to you, what, what's going through your mind? When I read it, I remember reading it years ago, one of the first times, maybe ten, about 10 years ago, that I really started reading the Bible seriously, and it wasn't just, I memorized a verse and, you know, in Bible drill or whatever when I was a kid, but I started reading it for real. I was like, this is like a prequel to Pirates of the Caribbean. That's what I felt like as I was reading. It's like Paul's on a ship, and they're shipwrecked, and then they get on an island, and it's just a crazy scene, and I think if we're not careful, we can just look at all the crazy things that happen, and then he gets bit by a snake, and then people are healed, and then people are cured, and all that can just seem, wow, this is crazy stuff that's happening. And if we don't step back and look at the bigger picture of what's going on in the book of Acts, we will miss the main point. And I think the main point of this passage is this. Jesus keeps his promises. Jesus keeps his promises. He can and does keep them. So as we look at this, I want to really point you to a few things. Jesus can and does keep his promises. That's the first. The second, what has Jesus promised us? And then the third, we're going to look at what that really means for us and how we can get those promises that he gives us. So first, Jesus can and does keep his promises. What's going on with Paul right now? Well, he's previously just escaped a plot by a certain group of Jewish men who didn't like what Paul was doing, didn't like what Paul was preaching, and so they brought themselves under an oath and said they're not going to eat or drink until they kill Paul. And so the officials in that area helped Paul be delivered from that plot. So people are wanting to kill him, and that's in Jerusalem. And then he gets sent north in northern Israel to Caesarea, and then they try, these same Jewish people try to get the governor there to send him back to Jerusalem to be tried. And they had planned to kill Paul on his way back down to Jerusalem. So a certain group of Jewish men really want Paul dead. Why? Because he is simply preaching the gospel. That Jesus has done what we have not to give us what we could not get. That salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus alone. It is finished. That's what Paul's preaching. That's what he's teaching. And these group of people don't like it, and they want to put him to death. And so to deliver him from that, he gets put under, under a Roman imperial guard because he's a Roman citizen. So if he dies unjustly being a Roman citizen when he's in you know, the presence of these Roman soldiers, these Roman soldiers would be killed. So they have to protect him as a Roman citizen. So he's under an imperial guard, and now he's been shipped off. He appealed to, I want to go to Caesar, he said. I appeal to Caesar. He wants to go all the way to the king in Rome. So he appealed to him, and now he's crossing the Mediterranean on a ship under imperial guard. And it's funny that if you read this passage, you see that Luke, who's writing it, keeps saying, we, we, we. Well, Luke was with Paul on that ship and on this journey to Rome. So he's traveling across the Mediterranean under an imperial guard. He's done nothing wrong. He just preaches something that a certain group of people really don't like and they want to kill him and so he has to be protected. And he's going out, mostly he's going there just because he's been faithful. 
This voyage was very hard going. They almost died multiple times. If you've been with us as we've been walking through Acts, I mean, just in chapter 27 earlier, Luke wrote in verse 20, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest lay upon us. Luke was a very eloquent writer. So that's a way of saying storm was real big. That's what we would say. Storm was big. He says, and no small tempest lay upon us. Luke was a physician. He's a doctor. So he speaks and writes in a way more eloquently than I would. But that's what he means. Big storm. All hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. This voyage that they were going on, they were going towards Rome to take Paul and other people were on the ship as well. They thought they were going to die multiple times. Then, finally, they made it to land, but their ship ran aground. And they had to abandon ship and try to get back. The people who could swim tried to swim, and most people had to float on some pieces of wood. And when they're about to do that, the soldiers that are on board say, you know, they had other prisoners on the ship with them, and they said, we can't let these guys get away. Who knows if they're going to try to escape when we have to jump ship and swim to land, so let's just kill them all. So they almost die at sea, and Paul's there, and then they finally get to land, and they run the ship into some rocks, and they're all sinking and about to die. And it's like, okay, we can jump out and swim, all right? And then the guards go, but let's kill all the prisoners. So can you see the roller coaster that Paul and Luke have to be on with what's happening here? Luke just says, we gave up and thought, we're just going to die. And we, he's, he writes it in a way to say, we kind of accepted it. Storm is big, we're going to die. We're finally there. Oh, but they want to kill us. But then they spared Paul's life because the Roman guard that was over Paul specifically knew, I've got to, I can't, this is no ordinary prisoner. I can't just kill him. I've got to get him to Caesar. So then they do finally get aground and they get ashore. And they even meet some of the locals and the locals are nice and they light a fire and everything's good. Nope. Then a viper comes out towards the heat and latches onto Paul's hand. Apparently, a poisonous viper that the locals thought, whoa, he escaped the sea, but justice, you see that capital J, justice in your Bible? They're saying a God, a creator, justice, the rules of the universe are saying, no, he is a guilty man, so he needs to be killed. He escaped justice in the sea, but now the viper has bit him and he's going to die. But then Paul doesn't die. He ends up actually curing people, healing people through what Jesus is doing through him. This whole scene, we just look at all those things like, golly, this is tough for Paul. His life was hard. Why is he being treated this way? Because he obeyed Jesus and he preached the gospel and he wouldn't stop. But a more important question to ask is, how on earth is Paul surviving all of this? Paul sailed thousands of miles in his life. If you look at his missionary journeys, he was an accomplished sailor. Luke probably was too because he journeyed with Paul a lot. But Luke even writes, we all gave up hope of living. They said, what's happening to us? We're all going to die. And somehow they don't in the storm. The guards are going to kill us, but somehow they don't. The snake bites Paul, but somehow he doesn't die. Why is Paul surviving all this? And the answer is earlier in the book of Acts. It's in Acts chapter 23, verse 11. Do you remember what Jesus said when he appeared to him? Luke writes that the following night, the Lord stood by him. That's Jesus came and stood by Paul and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem... So you must testify also in Rome. The bigger idea of what's happening here, we should see how on earth is Paul surviving? And the answer and the point is that Jesus had made a promise to Paul. You're going to get to Rome. I'm going to get you there. As you've testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must also do so in Rome. You're getting to Rome, and I'm getting you there, Paul. 
And the rest of what happens to Paul on this voyage should serve to show us that if Jesus makes a promise to you, to me, to anyone, he's going to make good on his promise. Paul's going to get to Rome, and, and so he does. You know, the other day I was talking to a friend of mine about this very fact that Jesus, when Jesus makes promises, he keeps them. And as we were talking, he, our friend was just reminded that when he and his, his brother and sister were young, their father, who didn't live with them, would call around a little before Christmas time and promise that he was going to come see them and visit them on Christmas, and he would bring them presents. My friend said for a couple years in a row, he called and made those great promises, and he never showed. And that was hard. And finally, we just stopped believing him. My friend said, I, I don't think his intentions were wrong. I think when he made that promise, he intended to. Like, he didn't, he wasn't just lying, saying, I'm going to tell them that I'm going to come see him and bring him presents, but I'm really not going to. It's like, I don't think he was doing that. He intended to follow through with the promise, but the stuff that controlled him, he just, he just couldn't shake it. And he didn't make it. Jesus is not like that. Jesus has the best intentions for you. If you're in Christ through faith in Him, Jesus has good intentions for you. So He makes promises not thinking, ha ha, I'm not going to keep them. No, He makes them with your best intentions in mind. And what's more, He doesn't just have good intentions, but He's sovereign over all so that no one can stay His hand or thwart His plan. If Jesus makes a promise to you, He's going to do it in the Word. Don't look for some extra biblical revelation in prayers like, I think God promised me this. Look to the Word. What Jesus has promised you in the Word, what He has spoken to you through the Bible, take it to the bank. Now, if today I wrote you a check for $10,000, and tomorrow you're going to go to the bank, what are you going to think as you're going to the bank to try to cash that check. If you know me well enough, you'll probably go, I don't think he has $10,000 in his checking account. I, maybe, maybe he sold a lot of motorcycles the last few months or something. I don't know what's going on. But you would probably have something inside you that would go, who knows if this check's going to clear. I guess I'll try it. At the same time, what if Bill Gates wrote you a $10,000 check? Does the way you go to the bank tomorrow change? Does your mindset change? Do you think at all that that check's going to bounce? No. Why? Because you know that not only did he have good intentions in writing that check, but you know that he can back it up. And so it is with Jesus. Totally sovereign over everything. If he makes a promise, not only does he have good intentions, but he will follow through. He can and does keep his promises. Do you bank your hope on Jesus and his promises? When you're going through, to use allegory a little bit, when you're going through life's storms, when you go through shipwrecks, when something suddenly comes upon you like a snake biting you in the hand, it's just like, golly! Are you sustained by the promises of Jesus? You can be, because he'll make good on them. So one of the problems with that is sometimes I think we can think that Jesus has made certain promises to us that he hasn't actually made. So what's really important is not to go, you know, Jesus, well, I was praying and I feel like Jesus promised me this. <clears throat> Get rid of that. Could be, could not be. What you know for sure is what's in the Word of God. So the promises that Jesus has given you in the Word of God, that's where you need to bank your hope. Not in a subjective feeling that may, have, may or may not be true while you were praying or a sign or anything like that. Bank your hope on the promises of God in the Word, what He says. 
The problem is we don't do that a lot of times, or we look at specific verses in the Bible and we try to apply them to us when they were really a promise more for a specific person in a specific time, not for all of God's people. For instance, you can, you can be barren. That's a way to say you can't get pregnant. And you can easily look at passages, especially in the Old Testament. You can look at Abraham and Sarah. Say, so, you know, they were getting into their old age, and they had never had a biological child, and you as a woman wanting a baby can go, you know, you see that God promised Sarah that she would have a baby. So I claim that promise, and that promise is for me. Jesus has promised me I'm going to have a baby. That's not healthy. That's not right. That doesn't apply to you. And you can do yourself and other people a lot of harm if you don't do careful study of the Word of God and try to apply things that's like, you know, we're going to defeat our giants. David knew that God would help him kill Goliath. So you know what? I'm just going to fill in the blank. I'm going to defeat my giants. Not every promise in the Bible given to a specific person is directly applied to us. We have to be careful in doing that. But there are pr plenty of promises in the Word that do apply to God's people as a whole, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So what we really need to do, what you need to do, as we look at this passage, the application is not just, man, Jesus keeps His promises, but you need to ask in your heart, what promises has Jesus made me? So what promises has Jesus made us? Well, I'm going to point you to four, and I think they're all in this passage that we're in, in Acts 27 and 28. First, what has Jesus promised us? That we will have tribulation. That we will have tribulation. We will, as Christians and non-Christians, all of us, but especially Christians, we will suffer. Look at Paul here. I don't even have to elaborate on this. The whole thing is highlighted by it. We gave up hope of living because the storm was so bad. We made it to land and we ran aground and we're going to drown. Oh, we're not going to drown. We can swim to shore, but the soldiers want to kill us. Oh, we got to shore and there's a fire and I'm warming up and a snake bit me. Does this not seem almost exactly like the promise that Jesus gave his disciples in John 16:33? We just simply said, in the world, you will have tribulation. It will be hard. Sometimes things will go very badly. That's a promise. Now look, we, we say that a lot when we gather as Ecclesia. You may have noticed that. We emphasize that a lot, that... God is sovereign over our suffering. He's promised us suffering. We will have tribulation. We emphasize that. Why? Why do we always, you know, beat that into the ground? There's a couple reasons. The first is because it's everywhere in the Bible. Do you see it even right here? Jesus says, you're going to have tribulation. And Paul's being as faithful as any of us, probably. But he's going through all of these hard times, all these tribulations, it's everywhere in the Word of God. The second reason we emphasize it a lot is because a lot of people, especially in our context, who call themselves Christians and Christian pastors and Christian ministers, teach the exact opposite. So it's something that we as your pastors feel like we need to hit the nail on the head frequently with that because prosperity theology, word of faith, name it, claim it, Theology is rampant in our area especially, and it's just not biblical. It's not what the total revelation of God is communicating. You just look at the Apostle Paul's life right here. You look at what Jesus promises in John 16, 33, and you don't have to go much further than go, okay, you will have tribulation. Paul's experiencing it. Our life's going to be hard sometimes. Peter says, when he writes to a multitude of churches, do not be surprised when the fiery trial comes upon you to test you, to prove you, purify you. Do not be surprised when the fiery trial comes upon you to purify you as though something were stra strange were happening to you. Jesus promises you, you will have 
tribulation. Second, Jesus promises us that we will be blessed beyond measure. We will have tribulation and we will be blessed beyond measure. Sometimes things will go really bad. Sometimes things will go really well. I mean, look at, look at verse 1 in chapter 28. You see this kind of turn of the tides and this, how everything goes with Paul. After we were brought safely through, now try to read this from a positive standpoint. Yeah, he gets bit by a snake, but look what happens and look what it serves to do. After we were brought safely through, we then learned that the island was called Malta. The native people showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and welcomed us all because it had begun to rain and was cold. I got on to verse 7. Now in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the chief man of the island named Publius, who received us and entertained us hospitably for three days. It happened that the father of Publius lay sick with fever and dysentery. Yikes! And Paul visited him and prayed, and putting his hands on him, healed him. And when this had taken place, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and were cured. They also honored us greatly. And when we were about to sail, they put on board whatever we needed. After kind of the bad stuff happens, things start going really well. That was probably a breath of fresh air for Paul and his sailing companions, but it's really fulfilling what Jesus says what he promises us elsewhere. We see the example of it right here. Sometimes things will go really badly. Sometimes things will go really well. You remember that, that place in Mark chapter 10? I mean, we just went through the entire gospel account of Mark. You remember in Mark 10 when the rich young ruler, as he's called, comes to Jesus and Jesus says, hey, just leave everything you have and follow me. And he doesn't want to because he had a lot of money. He didn't want to leave his money. And then Jesus says, how difficult is it for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God? Remember that? Right after that, the, the apostle Peter, in his Peter-like way, says, Hey, Jesus, we've left everything for you. Okay, Peter, yes, I know you've left everything for me. That's kind of what we want to say. Thank you for bringing it up. But what Jesus says to Peter is probably not what I would say. I'm just like, Peter, shut up. This isn't about you. But he doesn't respond like that. He, he gives this promise. In Mark 10, starting with 28, Peter began to say to Jesus, See, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. That's a good promise. That's not a in the world you will have tribulation promise. That's a in the world you will be blessed beyond measure. And here's the thing. We don't get to define what the word blessing means. Are you with me? I'm so blessed. If you're in Christ, yeah, you are. But what do you think that means? Blessing, as far as what Jesus is talking about, he said, no one who's left, he's saying, no one who's following me, no one who has left whatever necessary to put their faith in me and follow me, it doesn't matter what you've left, you're going to gain more even right now than you've ever left behind. And how does he frame that blessing? Mostly, it's relationally. Your parents may hate you for loving Jesus. Your friends may abandon you, may disdain you, may make fun of you, whatever it may be. You are going to leave something behind in following Jesus. But what he's saying here is that you're going to be a hundredfold. You're going to be blessed for following me. And he means it relationally. And to put the nail on the head, he's saying, when you are in me and I'm in you, when you're in Christ, you receive a family in the church that is deeper 
deeper than your ordinary bloodline. Some of you know this to be true. You know that even following Jesus has put strife between you and your family, or you and your friends, or you and your whoever it may be. Some of you it has, some of you it hasn't, but you know that even receiving, coming into the church and being a part of the body of Christ, I've got brothers, I've got sisters, I've got mother and father figures, I've got younger brothers and sisters. What's mine is theirs. That's why he says lands. It doesn't mean, hey, if you follow me, I'm going to give you all this land. He's saying everything that belongs to Christians, they specifically, it's our job to specifically think like it's not mine, it belongs to Jesus. Therefore, whatever my Christian brothers and sisters need, it, it's not mine. It belongs to him. So let's help each other however we need. You need a place to stay? You can stay with me. You need help financially? If I've got money, I'm going to meet it. You will be immeasurably blessed if you're in Christ, and mostly it's relationally. Do you know that the church, especially your local body that you're living with and on mission with, is one of the primary gifts of Jesus to you in this life? Some of you know it, and some of you take it for granted. Maybe look at what Jesus even promises there in Mark 10 and say, that's a hundredfold of what I did have. We will be blessed beyond measure, and mostly it's relationally. Third, Jesus promises us that we will have rejuvenating joy. I think it's easy to have joy in the good times. Sometimes maybe for the wrong motives. We're really happy or joyful, but are we glorifying God in that as we enjoy when good things, when life actually goes pretty well? Do we enjoy it to the glory of God? That's the real question. But it's pretty easy to be joyful in the good times. But what about when that you will have tribulation promise. You're just kind of walking through that. How do you have joy then? Well, one of the promises of Jesus is that you will have that. In John 16, 22, he says, So also, you have sorrow now, but I will see you again. And your hearts will rejoice. And no one will take your joy from you. You know what he's talking about? This is right before he's going to be killed. He's talking about, you won't see me for a bit because I'm going to go die. and I'm going to be in the grave three days, but you'll see me again. What he's saying is that because of the resurrection, because of my finished work on the cross and my getting out of the grave, conquering Satan, sin, and death, securing your eternal salvation, you can have joy beyond the walls of the world. You will have a joy that no one can take from you. That's why he says, you will see me again, meaning you'll see that I'm alive and have conquered death. And no one will take your joy from you. Paul had that. That's why when he's writing from jail to the church in Philippi, he can even command something like, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. Like, Paul, you're in jail. It's like, yeah, but Jesus is alive. The gospel is still true. This story ends happy, period. And for that, I'm joyful. Even seeing situations like this, that Paul is not ever complaining. He finally gets ashore, and then what happens? Well, he uses his He's an apostle. He uses his apostolic authority and the things that he does. He heals people. Jesus heals them through him, but Paul is at work. No one will take your joy from you. That's why Paul can write in 2 Corinthians 4, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Paul had a harder life, I would dare say, than most of us, than a lot of us combined. He would say, no, he banked his heart on that promise of Jesus. No one can take your joy from you. I'm alive. Paul knew, as he himself wrote, that all things 
God will work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So when the good happens, praise God, I'm joyful. When the bad happens, doesn't matter. Jesus says, I'm working that. I'm in that, intending that for your ultimate good. In Christ, you can know this story ends happily, period. Whatever your lot in life, whatever that tribulation looks like that you will walk through, you can still be joyful because Jesus is alive, the gospel is still true, and he will work everything out for good. Fourth, and lastly, what does Jesus promise us? He promises you, if your faith is in him, that you will reach a specific destination. Now, Jesus had promised Paul in Acts 23, 11, that he would reach a specific earthly city. But to us, he's promised us to reach a heavenly one, an eternal city. You know, that's the promise for, to, every single person who's in Christ, that no matter what happens in between, the story ends in the same place. If you're in Jesus, you will be in that eternal city one day. And if you can make it in that city, you can make it anywhere. As he, I think we're meant to step back and even see, Jesus said, Paul, I'm getting you to Rome. You're going to get there. And the crazy stuff that happens to him on the way should make us go, you know what? Jesus has promised that I'm going to get to a city, that I'm going to get to the new Jerusalem. And no matter what happens in between now and then, I know I'm going to get there because he's going to get me there. That's a promise for you. That is probably the chief way that you will have joy no matter what, that no one will be able to take your joy from me is, you know, that's where I'm ending up. I'm going to be there. Jesus is coming back here to make this new, to make this right, to right all wrongs and revelation Chapter 22, verses 1 through 5, we get a picture of what that eternal city that Jesus is going to come and establish, that we will live forever with him in what it looks like. And he says, John's writing, he says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree of life were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light or of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. That is an eternal city that is promised to you. Do you know that because of who Jesus is and what he's done, if your faith is in him, you're on a collision course with glory. You will reach your specific destination. There is no harm that won't be mended. There's no suffering that won't be worked ultimately for good. There are no tears you could ever cry that Jesus won't wipe away. There's no hurt that the tree of life will not ultimately heal. That's your destination. That's the eternal city you're promised. Do you live and breathe by these promises? If you do, no one will take your joy from you. Circumstances in your life can't take those promises from you. And if Jesus makes a promise, He's going to keep it. Now, how do we get that? How can we get that? We see the tree of life is back. Remember, that was in the Garden of Eden. But then in this eternal city that we will live in with Jesus forever, the tree of life is there too. 
yielding its 12 kinds of fruits and that its leaves were for the healing of the nations? How are we going to get there? How do we get the tree of life? In the simplest way we can put it, well, George Herbert actually answered it for us in the 1600s when he wrote his poem called The Sacrifice. It's a very long poem. One of the greatest poets in the last four or five hundred years. He imagines Jesus hanging on the cross. And the entire poem is just written from that point of view. That Jesus is hanging there and he's saying something out to us. And George Herbert writes, O oh, all ye who pass by, behold and see, man stole the fruit, but I must climb the tree, a tree of life for all but me. Because we have sinned, because we are not who we should be, because we've defamed the name of God, we've lived for our own glory instead of His, we don't deserve access to the tree of life. We don't deserve to have these great and beautiful promises of God. We deserve the opposite. We deserve promises of judgment, promises of wrath. But because Jesus submitted to the tree of death for you, you get the tree of life. Do you see that all these promises, they find their central focus at the cross of Jesus? The only way we get the tree of life is because he took that tree of death. The only way we get entrance into that eternal city, into face-to-face -face fellowship with God and his loving presence is because Jesus was thrown out of it on the cross. And he did it willingly. He did it for you. To give you those promises and to show you, no matter what you're going through, I'm going to make good on the promise I've given you. So devour the word of God. You want to have joy that no one can take from you? Bank your entire life on the promises of God and his word. You will not be put to shame. We have great promises, and they will be kept. And just to say what Paul says, for all the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. All of the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. So every one of the promises you read that are for you, for the people of God, you can know that ultimately those are ours because of what Jesus has done for us in his life and his death in his resurrection, all the promises of God find their yes in him. Look to him. You won't be let down. Pray with me. Father God, I thank you for, for your word. Thank you for these passages in Acts that we get to see what happened and get to think through how how we should think according to what you've revealed in your word. Help us to see that you are a promise keeper. You, are, you have best intentions and you are totally able to fulfill those promises you've made us. Help us to live and breathe by the promises you've given us in the gospel. Help us trust Jesus. Help us to bank everything on him to follow him, to obey him, to live in holiness in response to what he's done for us. Help us. Help us do what we can't do. Save and sanctify. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.